Glad to be back, y'all. I couldn't come last year because of the cotton-picking U.S. Navy, but I'm back. And I, most of you are familiar faces like old friends, but some of you are new, so I always like to get an idea of what my audience is like. Okay, first thing. If you have ever personally owned a Leonard Skinner album, raise your hand. Okay. Looks like I'm in friendly territory. Uh, other than that, like uh, Bob said last night, uh, certainly thanks are due to the organizers. And I know all our thoughts are with Phil, who is a great guy, and hope to see him again next year. But uh, let's give them all a big hand. Chris, who stepped in, Catherine, Bob, all the rest. OK, now, what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, other than having owned Leonard Skinner albums, there are two other things we have in common. The first thing being, what? What do we all have in common? We're all getting older. <laughs> and the second thing we all have in common, well, not all of us, but I suspect most of us, is that we don't have access to dark skies every night or even more than once in a while. And those are the two basic things that my talk tonight addresses. And this is the bottom line. It's nice outside. It's cool. Summer's over. You want to see some stuff. This is what you see. And this is actually more than you see. This is a, a short minute or two exposure, or maybe 30 seconds I took from my backyard. You can see Orion's belt, and you can see the nebula, but look at all that bright junk. That's generally what most of us see. Well, again, like I said, that was a, a photographic exposure back when we used this stuff called film. I know most of you young folks don't know what I'm talking about. But that's what our backyards look like, most of us. But we still want to see stuff. I love the Crab Nebula. I know everybody, probably even the greenest novices around you, feel the same. You love it. You love the pictures of it, it's what you love. Because what you see is that. Maybe, on, on a good night. Uh, and this is what I would see with my little four inch Palomar Junior reflector back in the 60s. When the skies were a little bit better, these days you'd be lucky to see it that good in an eight inch. But I still want to see the Crab Nebula, it's M1. It's very famous, it's a supernova remnant. It, it has a, this huge history and a huge amount of science behind it. I want to see it. And there's a way you can see it. This is a 15 second image with video. Stand by. There's always some kind of a glitch with me and the dadgum computers. Okay. Let's back up. <clears throat> this is what we see with an eyepiece and a telescope in our backyard. This is what I see with an 8 inch telescope uh, without an eyepiece in my backyard with a video camera. That looks pretty good, especially considering that's 14 seconds on, in a backyard, or actually this was out at our club's in-town site where the skies were every bit as bad as they are in my backyard. And as you can see, this is a shot taken back in the 50s with the 48-inch Oshin Schmidt telescope at Mount Palomar for the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey. And actually, I'm seeing a lot of what's in this image. This is with a C8, plus mine's in color. Plus, you notice theirs is blown out in the middle. It's burned out. I can see a lot of detail in here. Uh, but for certain, I can see the basic shape that's uh, in the pulse plate. No, no problem. And Astro Video will allow you to do that. And we're in, a, in a minute, we'll talk about what these cameras are. But let's talk about what they're for, what they do first. It's more than a light pollution feeder. It's also an aperture multiplier. I've heard people say that a camera like the Malin Cam will increase your telescope's aperture about three times. 
And that's somewhat true. Actually, it's probably a lot more than that. It's probably a lot more than three times. Uh, it's possible to see spiral details in M83 in an amateur telescope. And you, most of you have probably done that. This is the famous Southern Spring Galaxy. Uh, but you're not going to see it like that, of course. I don't see, like, see it like that in this telescope. That is an actual amateur telescope. It's known as the Beast. It's a 42-inch computer-controlled Dobsonian. It used to live in Chiefland, Florida, where I could go down and use it all the time. Now it lives out in New Mexico. Oh, and by the way, that is not, I repeat, not ZZ Top. Okay? Just want that understood. With the beast on a good night, when the scene was right, that giant mirror was acclimated, I could see M83 looking a lot like that but not exactly that good. I mean, certainly I wouldn't see any color, and even with the 42 inch, the spiral detail was something that more came and went than something you could stare straight at. But this is a shot with my C8. Again, it's really not that different from this. Obviously, one caveat, while a video camera can make an 8-inch telescope gather mo more light than a 42-inch, you're not going to get the resolving power of a 42-inch. On the other hand, even if you live under good scene, you don't get to take advantage of that supreme resolving power very often. And that was one of the problems with the beast. When it was good, it was very good. Uh, when it was uh, under unsettled skies, even down in Florida, you might as well ju just give it up. Uh, would I want a 42-inch telescope like that? No. No. It's a specialized instrument for specialized things, and Tom Clark built it, and he did a lovely job of it, but unlike a 20-inch amateur telescope, it's not really suited for every night general observing. But this is what I see with my 8-inch, and that's plenty for me. You can see the spiral form easily. Uh, the bar, and you can see color. And let me, this is not a stack of images or something. This is a 14 second exposure, and this is a simple screen grab off my monitor. It has not been prettied up. I think the only thing I did was take out the amp glow, and we'll talk about that in a little while. This is M83 like I li like to see it. And right now, I'm gonna stop and talk about that. About four years ago, I said to myself, self, you're getting older. I want to see something. It was fun back in the day to hunt Messiers and NGCs and just be satisfied to say, well, that fuzzy spot there in my telescope is M83. It sure would look good from out under a dark sky, but at least I've seen it. At my age, I'm over the at least I've seen it stage. I'm at the stage when I want to see what the universe looks like. I want to see what the universe looks like. Uh, a few years ago, and I think I actually did a talk to y'all, maybe the last time I was here, I decided I was going to observe all the Herschel objects, all the objects, the deep sky objects discovered by William and Caroline Herschel, somewhat over 2,000 objects. And I didn't want to just check them off. I wanted to see them. I wanted to really see them. I wanted to get a sense after almost 50 years in astronomy, uh, with one toe maybe in the amateur camp and one toe in the professional camp, at least as an educator, I wanted to get a sense of what was really out there for myself. I wanted to see the shapes of these galaxies that Herschel and Caroline found, and I wanted to see what's the next level behind the NGC, and I wanted to see it with my telescope. It's fun to look at Hubble pictures and stuff like that, but that's just something you see on the internet, something you see that somebody posts on Facebook every day. And don't lie to me, you all look at Facebook every single morning, I know you. Uh, on the other hand, I did not, one, want to fool around with a huge CCD camera. Uh, I've got one, I've got a good CCD camera from SBIG. Guess what it does? 
it stays in its case. I don't have the weather, and until now, now that I'm retired, I didn't have the time to mess with it. I wanted to see lots of objects. I wanted to see them in detail, and since I'm lazy, I wanted to see them easily. And the way you're going to do that is with video. You really can't get an idea from just screen grabs. You can get a better idea of what a video camera is like a deep sky video camera from, these are actually videos that I took under compromised circumstances down in Louisiana and at my dark side. That of course is the lovely swan. Uh, you're not going to see all of this detail just in an eyepiece. Uh, you will get something prettier than this with a CCD camera, but you're going to devote most of your night to getting it. This is a 10 second exposure. <coughs> Where in Louisiana? Uh, near a town called Clinton. Okay. It's really nowhere. This was a little off focus for some reason. That's near where LSU used to have a telescope, isn't it? Uh, it's near where, where the laser interferometer is. Okay. Uh, with this, like I said, it's a little off focus, but you can see the power of video. Right. Uh, the colors come out easily. Again, this is, I think this was about 10 seconds. And the central star is no problem. Same goes for galaxies. What happened with this shot? This is with my C11 from Chiefland on a bad night, and I'd let the cables get wrapped, and as it tracked, they were tugging, and I was getting double star images. <laughs> Typical Uncle Ron foul up, and I did use the word foul, but I got the basic look of M51. The dumbbell, this was from just my dark site over at the Alabama-Mississippi state line, just a little bit a ways away from the casinos down on the coast. So the skies are not good. You see there's plenty of color, but what you'll also note is, again, I think this was 14 seconds, you're starting to pick up that external nebulosity that makes it look more like a football than a dumbbell or an apple core. And see, here's the thing, folks. You get pictures like this, like, I can do 20 or 30 a night. I can do 100 a night. It's that easy. You may recognize this. This is what, in my part of the country, we call the deer lick. NGC 7331, a nice galaxy. You can even see its big, prominent spiral arm. And you can also see some of the deer, the little NGC galaxies grouped around it. And that kind of gets us to a starting point. Let me further say that, yeah, I've done 100 video images in a night because it has led me to working a different way. Uh, when I was doing the Herschel project, I was out there to get the images. But then I'd take the recordings I made, the digital recordings home I made, and look at them in detail uh, in the comfort of my den on the big screen TV or on my computer monitor. And I found out that I appreciated what I was seeing much more that way than struggling over an eyepiece on a 90% humidity night at 85 degrees after midnight. So it is a different way of observing. But how do you observe like this? How did I get a video of NGC 7331? Now we get to start at the beginning. In the mid-90s, early 90s, video gear had gotten extremely cheap. And a few of us discovered some little cheap closed circuit TV cameras from a company called Super Circuits that specialized in video surveillance equipment. They had one in particular called the PC-23C. And we started buying them. And we found they could give you the moon and the planets uh, for the, those days, this was a pretty good image of Saturn. If you remember the days of film, planetary photography, this is not too bad. Uh, as I, I've told the story before, even this limited form of video astronomy was great for public outreach. We set up one night during Hale Bop, I suppose, and had thousands of visitors, and I put my C11 on Saturn and put it on a 15-inch television. 
There was a 20 inch daub set up next to me, had a beautiful image of Saturn. But it was hard for the kids to get to, and even the ones that got up to it had a hard time looking. Little girl came off the ladder, saw my monitor, screamed and said, Mommy, here's Saturn for real, not like over there, it's on TV. <laughs> But, uh, you know, what, what is one thing that's true of amateur astronomers, most amateur astronomers? We always want more. <laughs> Weren't interested just sticking with the moon and planets in black and white. And anyway, video cameras were swiftly outmoded for planetary work. The webcams came along. That's a whole other subject, but suffice to say that I took these back in 03, I think, with a simple, cheap webcam. It blew away anything you could do with video or photography, so it seemed as if there wasn't a place for video in astronomy. Maybe that video was something that had come and gone. What if we could, you know, capture the deep sky with it, though, and people tried. We found out with one of these little cameras, if you took thousands of frames of M42 and stacked them all together, you might come out with something that looked like a fuzzy star. But that changed. A company from this part of the country, Adirondack Video Astronomy, came out with a couple of cameras designed for the deep sky called Stellacam and the Stellacam 2. I was skeptical, but I was a speaker at the 2003 uh, Alcon in Nashville, and a guy had one out there. We decided we were going to have a freaking star party, even if we were in downtown Nashville at the Embassy Suites. So we went out in the parking lot. They did turn off the parking lot lights, and there was a moon in the sky, though, and you could see a few things. But this guy set up his Telecam 2, and we were seeing M8, M20, M17, M13, all of them in detail. And I said, you know, that's for me. That's just what I need. Uh, I didn't like the black and white, but I liked the idea, and I got a Stellacam too. Started playing around with it, but about the same time, a guy named Rock Malin up in Canada decided he was going to kick things up a notch with longer exposure times with his Malin cam. They were surveillance cameras. They were not different, really, from that little PC-23C that we used on the moon and planets, but they had some enhancements. Uh, they were very light sensitive, just like the little surveillance cameras. Uh, but Adirondack Video Astronomy and Malin Cam brought things to them that made them, you know, usable for the deep sky. For one thing, they were cooled. As you know, an uncooled electronic camera uh, makes for noisy pictures on long exposures. That's why your DSLR or even your point and shoot camera, if you take a long exposure, it subtracts a dark frame automatically. Cooling is another, or is the main way, to do away with that noise and makes it possible to go to 30 seconds or a minute with a video camera. Uh, and, and a lot of people wonder about that. Is it like using a CCD camera? where you take a picture and it shoots it to the computer and you sit there and finally it appears and looks like a custard pie. No. The difference is, is that video cameras are so sensitive, far more sensitive because of the kind of chips they use than your average CCD camera. They will deliver a picture that looks like your deep sky object in 10 or 15 seconds with no processing of any kind. Plus, it's also a psychological thing. Every time an exposure on your vid deep sky video camera, your Malin cam or your Stella cam ends, boom, it gets refreshed. So you have a continual stream of images going to your monitor. And it looks like you're just watching it in real time. You're not, you know, every 15 or 30 seconds a new exposure comes in, but that's not the feel you get. The feel you get with video is that it's immediate. I'm watching a TV show. This is like on the History Channel. I'm cruising the Milky Way. And also, when I say monitor, I do not repeat, I do not mean computer monitor. The current video cameras, the Malin Cam and the Stella Cam, output composite video. That means you hook them to a TV set or a DVD player, or you can use a simple attachment to send the pictures to your computer. But it's real nice to be able to take deep sky pictures again without the use of a computer. 
All you need is your camera and a monitor that has composite video inputs. Usually you have some kind of a little hand control box that allows you to control longer exposures, contrast, things like that with your video camera. Or we'll, we'll talk about the other side of video astronomy in a minute. These are, this is the Stellicam 2 and the Mellencam Extreme. These are probably, well this is the leader right now. This has been eclipsed by the Stellicam 3, but it seems to be falling behind more than that. Stellicam 3 is a good camera too, but it's not being promoted like the Malin cams. The Malin cams have one advantage over the Stellicams. They're color. Most people want to see in color. Here are the Malin cams, the Malin Cam Extreme, uh, and two of their less expensive cameras. By the way, up to this point, you're talking about $1,500 to get started in video, up to this point. You can go cheaper, uh, but up until now, that's meant compromising. This is the Malin Cam Junior, and this is a Ryan Starshoot video camera. The problem with them is they can only expose for five seconds at a time. That's not that bad. That's not that bad. You can do all the Messiers in five seconds. But if you could go just a little longer, I, did, I could have done the entire Herschel 2500 uh, with the Stellicam 2 that was limited to 10 seconds. But five seconds is maybe not quite enough. That's changing now. This is, these are three new cameras. This is the Malin Cam Pro Junior, and these are two cameras from a company called Astro Video Systems. They're in the $500 range, and they will allow you to go as long as you want on exposures. This one is even cooled for a little over 500 bucks. That makes it a little bit more attractive because who wants to spend $1,500 on a camera if they don't know they're going to like it? It's one thing to go out and get a DSLR because you know if you don't like taking pictures of galaxies, you can take pictures of your Aunt Lulu's birthday party. <laughs> but what's the catch? Can it really be that easy that you can go out and take a 10 second shot of M83 and one minute later your telescope slewed over to M13, you've got that and you're going to something else and object after object after object. Yes it is, but there are catches just like Amy Fowler, Farrah Fowler suspects. Amy Farrah Fowler. What do you need to do video through a telescope? Well you need a camera. Either $1,500 camera or a bargain camera, it doesn't matter. The requirements are the same. You need a moderately accurate telescope drive make, capable of making at least 15 second exposures without too much trailing of stars. Most driven telescope mounts will do that. The other thing that I find, have found is that it's one thing to look at stills of your video image. Uh, if you look at stills, an uh, oval shaped star just it kills you. kills me anyway. But looking at a video, if the stars aren't perfectly round, it doesn't seem so horrible. So most driven telescopes will be suitable for video. If you've got a gem mount, uh, an equatorial mount of some kind, you need a decent polar alignment. You don't need to spend hours on it, just a rough polar alignment. Uh, I do recommend a go-to telescope, because one other com one other characteristic of video cameras that I haven't talked about is their chips. They're small. They're very small. Uh, if you don't have a wide field telescope, the images that you produce with video will not be very impressive. You need some space around whatever it is, whether it's M51 or M13, to make it show up good on video. Luckily, there are plenty of telescopes that will fill the bill, maybe with an accessory or two. You need a monitor to view your images. That can be a TV set you got at Wally World that has video inputs on it. Something, some way to power the uh, camera and the monitor. You, if you have a uh, go-to telescope, you've already dealt with that. And a telescope with a focal ratio of about f4 is optimum. You can operate your video camera with a computer. If you already have a computer on the field, uh, why not? 
being able to do everything from your computer, send the telescope on go-to's, and set up the camera is actually easier than not using the computer. What do I do? How do I observe these days? I go, I go down to Chieflin, I plug everything into AC power so I don't have to worry about freaking batteries. I set up a picnic canopy in the winter, I put sides up and have a little black cat heater. I sit under that canopy all night at the laptop and at the monitor uh, taking my images and that means I can go to 3 or 4 a.m. If I have to stand out in the cold with a Dobsonian at the eyepiece, I might make it till 1 a.m. Uh, Nevertheless, like I said, you do not have to have a computer for video cameras. Uh, this is the control program for the mailing cam. I put this up here to show you the two sides of it. One is that you can do a lot with it. Yes, this is just a freaking video camera, but you can make all kinds of adjustments to the image. The other thing, and this fits in very well with a user-friendly, simple philosophy of deep sky video, is that they give you this control panel. You want to take a deep sky image, mash that button and it sets everything up for deep sky or the planets or the moon or whatever. This is what my gear looks like out on the Chiefland observing field. This is the bridge of the USS Possum Swamp. <laughs> you know, like uh, action stations. Set condition one throughout the ship. Prepare for combat jump. But I sit here, I'm comfortable, I see a lot. Uh, this is my display. You could use a TV set you got from Walmart for 99 bucks that has video inputs. I like to use this little DVD portable recorder for two reasons. One, being cheap, I already had it. The Navy used to make me go on sea trials uh, for all of their ships, their Aegis ships and their amphibious assault ships and I always took along a DVD player to look at movies. And this little DVD player, and you can still get these, is cool because it'll work off of 12 volt uh, power if necessary. And it's got a decent little screen. Records also? No, we're coming to that. We're coming to that. Uh, since I like to take my recordings home and look at them in detail on the computer or the big screen TV, it's not, uh, I just need a screen that's big enough so I can accurately focus. Now. From the video camera, they go into this switch. And I can switch and send the video either to the display or this little Orion DVR. Now, I could have just run, them, run the video to both the display and the recorder at the same time, but I found out it didn't have enough oomph, the mailing cam didn't, to drive both. Now, I could have used a video amplifier and uh, boosted the signal, but I already had this switch left over from the VCR days, and being cheap, I just used it. When I see something on the screen I like, I push this button, send it to the little recorder, and record it. Just that simple. How many can you do in one night? I've done 200 in a night. I looked a little <laughs> messed up. But. Uh, since some people, especially my generation, are not that happy about computers, not everybody of my age group is like me. This is one little black duck who is not afraid of the Unix OK prompt. But not everybody likes computers, and these are, uh, this is a display from the mailing cam. If you don't use a computer, you can send this display to your video monitor and use a little control box or these buttons on the back of the camera and select the settings that you want just like you would on the computer. Uh, some mailing cams require an additional little controller to set the exposure of the camera if you don't want to use a computer. And that's one peculiar thing about video cameras, deep sky video cameras. Both of them, all of the manufacturers have kind of had to do some workarounds to make a video camera which normally exposes for how long? 1 30th, 1 30th, 1 30th, 1 30th, to make them do like a minute, two minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. And uh, with the mailing cams, it's either setting that exposure with the computer or with this wireless remote control system. That's me at Chiefland. Uh, what kind of a telescope? Dobsonian's refractors and SCTs all work. 
With an SCT, you want a reducer, an F3 reducer. The video camera makers sell reducers. I use an old Mead F3.3 reducer that screws onto my rear cell. It works fine with the C11. It works fine with my new Edge 8 inch. You just need to get your telescope down around F4 somehow. And it, you can go as large as you want. This is a mailing cam extreme on a 22 inch Dobsonian of my friend Carl Wright. As you can expect, he can make some lovely detailed images with this rig. Or a small refractor will do very well as well. Uh, you can do two, you know, a video camera is great for the pretty stuff. But I guess the first time that I was really truly impressed about one, what one could do was one night in the woods of Louisiana at the Deep South Regional Stargaze. I didn't know what I wanted to look at. I didn't have any project going on. Uh, so I looked at my copy of uh, Deep Sky Planner and noticed that there was the Hickson Galaxy Group list. Those are some pretty dumb suckers. 16th magnitude, 17th magnitude galaxies, albeit very small. So why don't I see what I can get with an 8-inch telescope and a 10-second video camera? I was using the Stellacam 2 back in those days. So I started shooting these galaxy groups. And you know what I found out? I found out that I was picking everything up basically that was on the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey, Palomar Observatory Sky Survey plates of those galaxy groups. I was picking up everything that appeared on those plates, every member, and with some of them I was seeing the same details. That's when I really decided there was something to this video business. Uh, of course, you know, like I said, they're great for public outreach. One of the reasons being, not just because kids think TV is cool, is that what does the public have, uh, what, what is it like when you try to show the public the deep sky? They have an awful hard time seeing anything. Even M13 or M42 for not just a kid, but anyone who's never looked in a telescope, it's kind of hard. Where do you put your eye? How hard do you hold back your eye? Do I have to have my glasses on? Uh, they can see a lot better uh, if your telescope is showing them an image on a 32 inch TV. Yeah, and it's not one at a time either, and you don't have to go through the constant litany of, just look, don't touch. Oh, let me see if it's still centered in the eyepiece. You've heard that before. Uh, but again, the 10-second Stellacam 2 uh, would bring home any, Stellicam, any uh, Herschel object I tried it on. And again, you can't get an idea of what video can do just from still frames, because these are just simple screen grabs and uh, it's the same as if you were looking at a VHS tape and stopped the tape and looked at a still. It's kind of fuzzy or a motion picture or even a DVD. It never looks as sharp. When you're looking at a moving image of this it looks mucho better. But these nevertheless don't look bad for just screen grabs. That's NGC 253. I love video for the freaking little comets that drift through the solar system every year. Who would want to go out and spend a lot of time CCDing or even visually observing something that's going to be a tiny <coughs> fuzzy star? A video can, camera can make a lot of these little comets look pretty darn cool without much effort on your point part. This was Comet Hergenrother from not too long back. M13. I started collecting supernovae with my uh, video camera. This is, was the old Stellacam 2. That's just M51 with the mailing cam. Longer exposure, cool, less noise, just looks better. I also had started to pick up this bad boy here, that funny looking kind of e -shaped, backwards E-shaped uh, nebulosity around NG, next to NGC 5195. You notice I'm also picking up Dark lane detail in 5195. Not bad for 14 freaking seconds, is it? M101, that's particularly nasty. Oops, how did that get in there? I'll be, I'll be dang. What's that doing there? I don't know. Veil. Uh, M87's jet, I always wanted to see it, never could see it in the biggest daub I looked through. Here it's fairly easy, it's right there. 
Actually, it, this looks better uh, with the Stellacam 2. The, the usual problem with seeing the jet with uh, imaging is the galaxy starts getting too big and burned out. But nevertheless, you can still pick it up. If you ever wonder, want to know how to find the jet, look for these, for these two little bad boys. Those are two little galaxies that kind of give you uh, an orientation. It's almost, the jet's almost 90 degrees counterclockwise of those, depending on the orientation of your scope. Dumbbell, dumbbell. Again, just a screen grab, but getting lots of that football shape. Color's pretty good, central star is there. M81 is particularly difficult. Uh, the only place I've ever seen the arms of M81 look worth a poop have been at the Texas Star Party with a large scope. This was from uh, a putrid site where we used to do public outreach. The ring again. Ooh, this is one of my all time favorites. Who loves NGC 1097? <laughs> what? <laughs> Dudes, get on Google and look up NGC 1097. You owe it to yourself. Do you like barred spiral galaxies? Do you like classic looking grand design barred spiral galaxies? This is one. And you got this little bad boy that's disturbing him. NGC 1097 Alpha. Questions, and that's what I really, I've kind of sped through this. We're not only running up against darkness, but I know people want to know how they get started in video, and I can really address your concerns much better with questions. So let's have them. Yes, sir. With, the with mine, it has never been a problem, ever, ever, ever. And where do I live? Central. Down yonder in Possum Swamp, like observing underwater. Why <laughs> is that? I have the video camera. It's got an inch and a quarter nose piece on it. It's inserted into the back of the telescope, but the back of the telescope uh, has a reducer lens on it. So I think it's kind of sealing up the video camera and just do never forms. It never happens. I've never had that problem. I'm thinking that the people who have condensation, let's call it problems with a cooled video camera, have it in a Newtonian sticking in the focuser where it's kind of open to the outside air. Uh, the inch and a quarter nose piece also acts as a heat sink for the... Uh, cooling system on the Malin cam, and I think that kind of helps too. You could put an optical window in there if, if, you, were, if you had a big, huge job and you needed to, to do that. You could, you certainly could, but actually the fact is too, even most DOB users are going to have a reducer lens in there somewhere of some kind. So it, I was worried about the same thing given where I live, but it's proven to be a non-problem and the cooling really does make a difference. Next. Yes, sir. Yeah, um I read a while back that some people were looking at using these Samsung security cameras and taking out the, the IR filter yeah. and just plugging them in and just uh, you know, taking the video, getting a frame grabber and stacking the frames. And, and you can do it's that. Lot, it's about 10% you know, of the cost of a mailing cam. So why, you know, is that really... Well, have you, looked, have you ever looked at the... Uh, at the uh, video astro group on the Cloudy Nights bulletin board. If you go there, you'll see some pictures from the camera that its adherents are now so fond of, they're referring to it as the Sammy. <laughs> and uh, the images are okay. Uh, my only thought about it is you're going to spend at least a hundred bucks on one, probably, I believe. And it's like these cameras, except more, more so. Is it really good enough to make you want to move on to the next level where you're going to really start, be able to start seeing stuff looking good? Or even if it does, will you regret having wasted 100 bucks on a Samsung closed circuit camera? I, six months ago, I would have told you, yeah, get you a Sammy. But that was back when a Malin Cam Extreme was going to cost you $1,500 to $2,000 once all was said and done. Things are changing. I 
think these cameras are going to change the game. I think there's a hunger for video astronomy because people want to see something from home or their compromised uh, club site. And these cameras will let you do it for about 500 bucks. And in the amateur astronomy scheme of things, that's not really a hell of a lot, is it? You can easily spend more than 500 bucks on an eyepiece these days, can't you? And if you invest in a camera that one, will really begin to show you what video can do. And two, if you want to move up to the next level, to a mailing cam extreme or a Stella Cam 3, I think you'd be able to sell one of these a lot more easily than you'll be able to sell your modified Samsung closed circuit TV. Uh, again, go on cloudy nights. You'll find image galleries and stuff like that that shows you what you can do with a Samsung camera. You might, you know, it might be something you want to do. Uh, I went through all of this C with the PC23C and all that, and it was kind of fun, but when you've got these available, eh, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's quite going to be quite as popular from here on out from people who are more interested in seeing stuff than they are tinkering. If you're into tinkering and playing electronics, uh, more power to you. I had to do that at work for 30 years. Now I just want to see cool stuff. Next question. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, OK, I, we observe halfway between Washington and Baltimore. Yeah. And I can't see these objects in order to find them. How do you know that, you're, that you have? With a go-to telescope, most modern go-to telescopes, at a focal ratio f3 or f4 in an 8 inch telescope will put your object on screen okay. on in the frame of the chip it's never been a problem for me with either a mead go to or a celestron go to put the camera on your telescope focus up on a bright star a, go to a line and off you go uh, and, and i know it sounds easy but that's it and people are doing it every night you hook this camera to your go-to scope and you start mashing the buttons and punching in objects and pretty soon you've uh, done 50 objects, 100 objects, who knows? Yes, sir? They call me obvious. That's because it's not an F10, right? It's an F4. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make Now, sure I, I will it. say this. I have That's never good. had that much of a problem at slightly higher focal ratios of getting objects on the chip even though the chips of video cameras are small. But the problem is not so much finding with a modern go-to scope, is that at that focal ratio, an F10 8-inch SCT, uh, the objects don't look good. Some objects do, like if you're wanting to image the interior details of a small planetary nebula, yeah, F6 or F10 might be good for most things. As you saw in my picture, freaking M101 almost filled the frame. You don't, you, you've got to have some dark sky around it to provide a little contrast so you can hope to see something. No different from regular photography. Photography is about one thing, focal ratios, speed. Everything else is secondary in imaging for most of the things we want to look at anyway. Yes, sir. What's the toughest learning curve issue with this? That you've done? The toughest learning curve is really simple. My buddy Skizix gets him a mailing cam. It comes in the mail via UPS. He throws it in the car along with his telescope and his batteries and runs out to the dark side. He gets out there and he doesn't know what to do. The key is to start out simple. Start out somewhere where, like your backyard, where you, you may not see things in as great a detail, even with a video camera, but you've got plenty of power. You can run in the house and read the instructions. The other thing is, always play with your camera in the daylight first. Uh, before your camera comes, assuming you're going to operate with a, with a computer, play with the software. Uh, when I got a, bought a mailing cam, I downloaded the software two weeks before and played with it. There was still a learning curve, but I was able to pretty much get going from night one. The, uh, there just isn't too much of a learning curve as long as you've, uh, you're confident in using your basic telescope. 
It's just not that hard. Video does not add the level of complexity that CCD does. Now, the only catch is, you know, you got to connect up the video camera to the computer to the, and that's kind of another story in itself, but it's really not that difficult if you play with it in the house. And it's not difficult at all if you're not using a computer, you're just using a video camera, you're controlling it with the buttons on the back, and you're just looking at it on a monitor, you're not recording anything. You can start out like that, and then add the computer, then add a video recorder, and keep going with it. Or you may, some people like to use a frame gap grabber on their computer and try to make pretty pictures with video cameras, although I don't think that's their forte. Yes, sir? Does it matter if you were going deep first, or does it make sense to go planetary early while you're learning? Here's the only problem with that. The Malin cam can do an oak, and the same thing goes for the Stella cam, which is still around. As an aside, let me, Stella cam was first. They went out of business. They sold it out to a company on the West Coast. They apparently still sell Stella cams, but they don't participate in any of the video user groups, nor do they have a website, so they're kind of, Malin cam is what most people are buying at this point. Uh, but uh, give me your question again now. Whether, like when you did your briefing here, you had the planetary phase. Well, you okay. We and again, I don't want to put down the mailing cams. They do have a planetary setting. A cheap webcam will do better. Okay. I don't think that there's any necessity to doing plants first, especially since it's such a different deal. What focal ratio do you want to have for planets? F20 or F30. You want a Barlow. You may want a flip mirror even on your go-to scope. It's just a completely different world. If I wanted to take pictures of galaxies, I'd start out taking pictures of galaxies. Next. Yes, sir. Is there a particular API stack program you like? Uh, I'm not that into it. To me, it's about looking at the live video. But I know the people who do it tend to use either a specialized program that Malin Cam uh, has had written for them where it will not only stack, it will allow you to control your camera. But what I have done is used a free program called Deep Sky Stacker. It works. Registax, you know, which you've probably heard of that people use for planetary imaging, will also work on the deep sky. But that's not my bag. I just like to look at the pictures on my monitor, on my LG TV in the den while I'm drinking whiskey afterwards. If I want a pretty picture, I'll drag out the DSLR. Next. Oh, sorry, sir. Uh, how would you compare the DSLR? It's, it's, I would compare it like I would compare, I guess, visual, well, not even that, it's just two different things. It's two different things. With a DSLR, you're out to get a pretty picture. You're not out to get scientific data, for that you want a CCD, but you want a pretty picture and you're going to spend the night on one or two objects. And you're going to take that picture home and you're going to work on it until you've got something that's going to maybe get in his magazine. Or maybe not. At least that might be your aspiration. But with video, you want to see junk. I want to see 200 Herschel objects tonight. That's what video is for. Next. I know there's got to be another question. I always tell that to my students. Yes, sir. Seems like to me that video is for astronomy 101. Well, and it is. It is. Uh, it's not just the little kids who like video astronomy. It's uh, the public in general. It's very, I use it in my classes. And uh, there's a learning curve, sure. But basically that learning curve is not what it was 30 years ago. After 30 years of VCRs and cable boxes, most people can stick a camera in the back of their telescope, hook a cord from that to their monitor, and see something. That's, there's no dark frames, there's no flat fields, there's no curves, there's no yada, yada, yada. There's just looking at stuff. A video, can, and let me also say this, 
And I can't really duplicate it even from showing the videos. But whatever. I think that, that they're telling me to be done. Uh, one of the greatest freaking things about video, and you really have to look at it live on a monitor, is if you look at M13 from a video camera and you look at it in a CCD image, usually the video image is much closer to what you see with your eye. That's one of the things I love about video. It's like looking through an eyepiece, but it's more, better, gooder. <laughs> Thank you all. You've been a great audience. Let's get out and observe. I would not be surprised if there are some mailing cams on uh, the field. I know that Lyle Mars has a setup that's a semi-video system that will also give you some ideas about what video can do. And I'll be here uh, until Monday. And if you have any questions about what you should choose, what you should do, just ask me. We went through these slides in an awfully quick hurry. Okay. What's your favorite scanner shot?